want to thank you, UCSB, for hosting this. Uh, I want to thank Leonard Wallach for uh, convincing me to come, and it didn't really take much convincing. I was in Santa Barbara uh, last year, driving up from Los Angeles uh, on a, a day that was much brighter than this one. But uh, the uh, the mix of the of the water and the and the mountains is is really very is really very compelling, uh, really very compelling. I, I w well, I'll, I'll make sure that you can hear. Um, I also want to thank uh, the Taubman Foundation Institute for uh, their generosity in sponsoring uh, this series of lectures. I think it's really important to be exposed to a diversity and a variety of points of view. Uh, and you're going to hear that from me this evening. Um, I had the distinct honor and privilege for almost 25 years, which is a very long time. I've got a 24-year-old daughter and a 22-year-old son. 25 years is a long time to work on anything in a serious way. I had the distinct honor and privilege of, of working for the last six secretaries of state as an advisor on Arab-Israeli negotiations. Now, I say an advisor, uh, not a policymaker. The president makes decisions, the national security advisor makes decisions, the secretary of state makes decisions, advisors advise. Sometimes the advice is taken, sometimes it isn't. But during the course of my 25 years, I came to believe very deeply in three basic propositions very simple propositions. They guided me when, this, uh, when my diplomatic career began. They continued to guide me when there were negotiations worthy of the name negotiations. And they guided me over the course of the last four years where just about everything that right-thinking Israelis, Arabs, and Palestinians and Americans sought to achieve uh, lay broken, battered, or bloodied somewhere. Number one, I believe in an equitable and durable solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I choose my words very carefully here. I said equitable and durable. Equitable in the sense that it can meet the core needs of both sides. Durable in the sense that it can endure, it can last. I did not mention the word perfect justice or 100% because in conflict resolution these terms are irrelevant. In life, I would argue, these terms are irrelevant. Nobody gets 100%. Life is about trying to find the balance between the world the way we want it to be, on one hand, and the world the way it is, on the other. And the one phrase that should be emblazoned across the portal of every negotiating room in the world, no matter whether it's the Indian-Pakistani conflict that Seeds of Peace follows, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the conflict between Greek and Turkish Cypriots, or the conflict in the Balkans, is this phrase. The perfect should never, can never, be allowed to become the enemy of the good. Because when the perfect becomes the enemy of the good, not only does nothing happen, catastrophe usually in, ensues. So, number one, there is an equitable and durable solution which meets core needs and requirements as long as each side is prepared to make tough choices. Number two, the only way this negotiated solution will ever be achieved is through negotiations. Negotiations are, are not an ideal or perfect instrument. It's a, it, they are a highly flawed enterprise. Why are they flawed? Because they reflect human frailty and weakness, because they reflect the need for tough choices which are difficult for people and constituencies and national groups to accept. And they're flawed because they, they take time. And yet, they alone can provide a solution. And finally, I believe strongly in the basic proposition that the United States has a critical role to play in the resolution of this particular dispute. Not, not, a, not every dispute. But on the Arab-Israeli issue, the United States has a national interest. The United States has a moral interest. And the United States also has a demonstrated capacity, even though we do not always succeed, to be sure, to make a bad situation better. We can't impose a solution. This is an existential conflict for the Arabs and the Israelis. It is literally a conflict over physical identity and survival and political self-preservation. And in an existential conflict that revolves around basic existence, no outside party, no great power, no matter how powerful, has the right or the capacity to impose a solution. Because only those who will 
have to live and deal with the consequences of the solution and the decisions that they must take have the right and the moral authority and legitimacy to make those decisions. At the same time, there is no substitute in my judgment for a key U.S. role as a broker, as a facilitator, as a supporter, as a patron, as an, as an ally of this process, and ultimately as a reality therapist to call each side out when in fact their behavior deviates from what is right or when it deviates from policies that the United States thinks that it's in, in, in its own best interests. These three propositions, I, I would argue to you, no matter how counterintuitive they may appear at the moment, cannot be abandoned. Because if you choose to abandon them, then you might as well give up on the future. There will be no solution. There will be protracted conflict and violence. And nobody has the right, no matter how grim or bleak the current situation may be, nobody has the right to give up on the future. I resigned from the State Department in January of 2003, having worked for Colin Powell for two years, not over any dramatic issue of principle, but because I had reached a conclusion that the Arab-Israeli conflict had become a generational conflict. And when I say generational, I mean it will take time to resolve. How long is unclear, but this much I know. I worked on it for 25 years. And if you looked, if, if you invited a man or woman from Mars to observe the Arab-Israeli conflict over the course of the four years, that observer could only conclude that nothing had been done. I worked on this conflict for 25 years. I do not believe it will be resolved today, tomorrow, next month, next year. When you, when you start to straight line out beyond five, it becomes hard to predict. And I'd caution everybody, including myself, not to become so wedded to their predictions. But generational in, in the sense that even if political agreements are reached, peace and reconciliation is likely to take time and likely to be generational in character. I reached this conclusion. It was hard and it was bitter for me because I had worked a long time and I cared deeply about this. But I couldn't any longer entertain even my own illusions that conventional diplomacy alone, the kind of work that I did for 25 years, was enough. So I reasoned to myself that in a generational conflict, somebody needs to start thinking very seriously, very seriously, about what's happening and what will happen to the next generation. Because if, in fact, they are generational conflicts, then it is not this generation, my generation, that will inherit these problems. It's a younger generation. So I was given an opportunity that most people don't get in life. The founder of this organization, John Wallach, who created it in 1993, died of a very aggressive form of cancer in, in July of 2002. I was asked to head up Seeds of Peace, to leave the conventional world of diplomacy, and to pursue what I call transformational diplomacy. And what I would like to do this evening is to make six basic propositions, observations to you. Now, let me be very clear about something. I'm not here to sell you anything. I don't work for the U.S. government, the Department of State any longer. I have great respect for the power and effectiveness of American diplomacy when it's used wisely. I'm not here to sell you anything. I do believe that these six basic observations, however, drawn from 25 years of my experience in negotiations and now a short two years of being involved in this remarkable organization are worthy of consideration. I think in large part, I'm 55 and I'm not by any means suggesting to you that I've cornered the market on wisdom or philosophical observation, but I, I, I really do believe that in many respects negotiations are not much different than much of what is required to move through life. And you'll hear a little bit more um, from that, uh, I mean, little, from me a little later on. So let me begin with my first observation, which is the departure point 
for everything else that you're going to hear from me tonight. And if you take away nothing else, if you choose to consider nothing else that I'm going to say to you this evening, please, I urge you, give some thought to this one fundamental proposition. And it is simply this, that the Arab-Israeli-Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not some kind of morality play which pits the forces of goodness on one hand against the forces of darkness on the other. It's not some kind of conflict, Manichaean conflict between light and dark, in which one side rightfully can claim a monopoly on truth and on justice and on pain and on suffering. If only it were so, it wouldn't be so complicated. No, it is a deeply complex dispute and conflict in which both sides, in this case the Israeli and Palestinian side, has, have legitimate needs, concerns, and requirements which need to be met. Now decisions need to be made by each side to take into account the other side's needs, core requirements, and concerns. But the definition of a tragedy is really a conflict between competing justices. And in essence, that is what makes the Israeli-Palestinian conflict so compelling. That's why it's filled with so much pathos, because it is a tragedy. It pits two quite remarkable and extraordinary peoples against one another, competing for space, political identity, competing for overlapping sacred space. And if it is to be resolved, then those core needs and requirements will have to be met, not through some sort of artful con job or manipulation, but through a genuine process of understanding and negotiation. Now, you don't have to buy my first proposition. It's arguable. The Arab American and Jewish American community are filled in this country with people who don't buy this basic proposition. And I assure you, there is enough figurative and literal ammunition to arm yourselves with all kinds of compelling arguments to defend and to advocate one side's view of this conflict over the other. But I will also assure you of this, if you choose to take that route, to basically accept truth served up on a platter instead of trying to ferret it out for yourselves, not just going to one organization, one broadsheet, one embassy, one book, for your understanding of this conflict, then I would simply argue to you, it's your right to do that. But I would argue you essentially forfeit, abdicate the possibility of ever understanding this conflict, analyzing it correctly, let alone prescribing any balanced solution that will help to resolve it. This first point is elemental for serious work not just on the Arab-Israeli conflict, but I would argue on any of the great conflicts in the international system today. Second, only governments wielding political power can end conflict, stop violence and confrontation, and create political agreements only governments. I call this kind of diplomacy transactional diplomacy. It's what I did for 25 years. It's the domain of diplomats, of governments flying around the world in the Secretary of State's airplane trying to negotiate. It's the world of maps and national interests. And it's a legitimate world. Conflicts actually end as a consequence of governments and powers that get to the point where they're either exhausted or they want an alternative to protracted conflict. But those negotiations, if they're to reach agreements that last, must be based on a balance of interest, not on a skewed imbalance of power. In this sense, I believe that negotiations are not much different than good marriages, good business propositions, and good friendships. 
I, I've been married for 31 years, which is also a long time. And it seems to me that good relationships have to reflect a mutual reconciliation of needs. When they don't, when they're asymmetrical, when one party exercises more power than the other, when core needs and requirements are not met, then even if relationships last, I'm not sure they're worth much. The same applies to negotiation. Now, we've only had three examples of successful negotiations in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Only three. We have an Egyptian-Israeli peace, peace treaty, which was consummated in March of 1979. It's not perfect from the standpoint of either side. Ask any Egyptian or any Israeli. They'll speak volumes about how it's not perfect, but it's lasted. We have an Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty signed in October of 1994. Same logic applies. Ask any Israeli or Jordanian. They'll tell you where its deficiencies are, but it's endured. And then we have an Israeli-Palestinian series of agreements that were reached. Agreements were reached, but it didn't help. They didn't, help. They didn't hold. And Oslo has collapsed. The latter two, Egypt-Israel, Jordan-Israel, were based on a balance of interest. Each side to these negotiations got their core needs and requirements met. That is why they endure. That is the only reason. It is not love of the other. It is not sentiment. It is not idealism. It's because they got their core needs met. In the Israeli-Palestinian case, the core needs were not met, and the negotiations couldn't hold because there was no balance of interest. There was a highly dysfunctional asymmetry of power. Now, what was it? It's important to be honest and fair about it. Palestinians wielded what I would describe to you as the power of the weak, a very formidable power. It is the power to simply assert that since we are the weakest party to the negotiation, we are under Israeli military occupation, we have our rights denied, we don't have the support of a superpower, we can essentially abdicate or countenance forms of behavior because we are weak. We can acquiesce in terror, we can teach our children, condition them to incite, and we can take away from the Israelis what they need most, which is a reliable guarantor and security partner. Israelis, on the other hand, well, they wield the power of the strong. The power of the strong is self-evident. It is a power that flows from military, technological, and economic superiority. It is the power to create facts on the ground. Settlement activity, housing demolitions, land confiscation, bypass roads, curfews, collective punishment. Issues that have nothing to do with legitimate Israeli security needs or interests. Issues that reflect poli politics, issues that reflect ideology. When you marry the power of the weak together with the power of the strong, you get a disaster. And that's, in essence, why Oslo failed. Because each side, even though it would deny this to this day even, didn't meet the basic core needs and requirements of the other. Third. Governments can, in fact, negotiate agreements, political agreements, but they cannot take the process beyond the phase of political agreements. They can't. Diplomats can't do it with maps. Business transactions and propositions can't do it. Only individuals can define the character and quality of peace. Peace and reconciliation. And these are very abstract terms. You know, I, I, there are organizations that are peace organizations. I, I really don't know what it is that means. People describe my organization as a peace organization. Well, at the most general, simple level, yes, everybody wants peace. But what is that? Is that peace is the absence of conflict? Is that a non-belligerency agreement? Is it peace the way we have peace with the Canadians? Is it peace the, 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 the way the French and the Germans ha have peace? What is it? In order to create peaceful, normal relations between societies, transactional diplomacy won't do. You need something else. I would describe it as transformational di diplomacy. It's the power to transform relations between individuals 
and to create constituencies and networks of leaders who truly do understand the core needs and requirements of the so-called other and are prepared to humanize the face of the enemy. In a generational conflict, and this brings me, bring, brings me to my fourth point, this kind of transformational diplomacy is critical. Conventional diplomacy simply won't do, because in a generational conflict, time is required. Developing a network of young leaders is required. Even if the political agreements were reached tomorrow, the majority of Israelis and Palestinians would still need to be conditioned to understand and accept what the other really wanted and what the other was, was all about. Only transformational diplomacy, pursued in my judgment by non-governmental organizations and forces, have the capabilities to move beyond conventional diplomacy. And in essence, and this brings me to my fifth point, that's what Seeds of Peace is all about. Founded in 1993, during the salad days of the peace process, 46 Israeli Palestinian and Egyptian boys stood on the White House lawn on September 13, 1993 with their green t-shirts. Very famous picture is taken. Bill Clinton, Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, Shimon Peres, and 46 boys all wearing their green t-shirts with the leaders holding the green Seeds of Peace t-shirt in the foreground. Well, it's very interesting when you consider that picture today. Two of the four are dead. One is the chairman of the Israeli Labor Party, and the other is a former US president. What counts, I would argue to you, is not who is in the foreground, but who is in the background. Since 1993, those 46 have turned into almost 3,000. 500 prospective young leaders, chosen or supported by their governments, who come to Maine for a series of three-week sessions during the course of the summer. And when I say chosen by their governments, I mean selected by their governments, Indians, Pakistanis, Greek and Turkish Cypriots, but in the main, Arabs and Israelis, and in the main, Israelis and Palestinians. Now just imagine, imagine the first day, an Israeli and a Palestinian, by the way, girls came uh, in 1994, 14, 15, and 16 year olds, who may have lived kilometers away from one another, but who find them, have never said a word to one another, and who've been conditioned by their respective societies to hate each other, or at least to think grievous things about the other. That first night, in bunks, in a beautiful setting in the woods of Maine, about an hour north west of Portland. Israelis and Palestinians, boys with boys, girls with girls, find themselves sleeping literally next to the enemy. Many Israelis and Palestinians don't sleep that night, not because they're homesick, and not because they're jet lagged after 10 hours and four hours on a bus from Boston. They don't sleep because they're terrified. What are they terrified about? They're terrified that if they fall asleep during the course of the night, physical harm will come to them. And within three and a half weeks, I wouldn't believe it if I didn't witness it now for two summers. Within three and a half weeks, when they leave to begin that journey from the future back into the past, in essence, they're openly grieving and mourning the possibility that they will never again be able to interact with one another the way they did for those three and a half weeks in Maine. How is it possible in three and a half weeks to affect such a transformation? It's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I can give you a clinical answer. What I think happens is, is, is the following. We provide four freedoms at this facility for up to 500 of these prospective young leaders which they can't get at home. Freedom of movement, freedom of association without stigma, 
freedom to think more critically and independently than they've ever thought in their lives, and also freedom from fear, which we take for granted even in the wake of 9-11. Do you know that no Israeli or Palestinian parent today, today, what's today, March 2nd, March 3rd, no Israeli or Palestinian parent today can guarantee their son or daughter three and a half days of absolute freedom from mortal injury or death. This notion of being freed from fear is, is critically important, I think, particularly for a 14, 15, and 16-year-olds who have experienced loss and trauma. Two hours every day, under the guidance of professional facilitators, the Indians and the Pakistanis, the Arabs and the Israelis, the Greek and the Turkish Cypriots, undergo some of the most traumatic, liberating, if you will, dialogue that you can imagine. And what is hard to believe, I sit through some of these sessions, is the amount of poison and venom and hate that can be stored up in a 15-year-old's mind. And during these two hours every day, all of this stuff comes out. All of it. And I'm not entirely sure how, the, how these young people rationalize it. But you take these abnormal experiences, these facilitation sessions, and you combine them with the normal circumstances of 24-7 interaction with a bunk identity and a dining room identity and a team identity and a seeds of peace identity, and you put it all together, and in the end, something quite amazing occurs. They don't agree on a solution to the Indian-Pakistani conflict, Kashmir, Jerusalem refuge. They don't agree on any of that. Something, in my judgment, something much more fundamental takes place. For the first time in their lives, they hear the story of the so-called other, not from a, a rabbi or an imam or a priest or a parent or a journalist, and Lord knows, not from a politician. They hear the story of the so-called other from a peer, a contemporary, whose humanity and decency they simply cannot deny and cannot ignore. This is a powerful transformation. They open their eyes for the first time and they look at the other and they see that this conflict really does have another side and that side is human. Now, that, we may take that for granted, but it is a fundamental proposition in, in the resolution of any conflict. They tell this wonderful story about the French playwright Guy de Maupassant, who when the Eiffel Tower was constructed to commemorate some Paris exposition in the late 19th century, railed against the Eiffel Tower as the worst architectural blight on the Parisian landscape. He hated it. And he wrote about it. But every day, de Maupassant would go to have lunch there. Finally, somebody got up enough <clears throat> nerve to ask him why, if he hated this place, why did he go? And know what he said? It's an apocryphal story, but it's a good story. He said, because it's the only place in Paris that I can't see it. And the fact is, that's what has happened to Israelis and Palestinians. They have willed themselves into a kind of functional insularity where their narrative, their story, their pain, their justice, their rendition of the truth is the only one. It's dislodged the others. We change that. We fundamentally change it, not by propagandizing them or preaching some, some solution or another, but by creating an environment where they develop respect and empathy. This is not, this is not what I call kumbaya coexistence. This is not some kind of naive, idealized camp where people sing songs and plant flowers and hold hands. This is not that at all. This is the essence of what is required to diffuse conflict. One Jordanian woman, she's now 24, who went through the program, at 17 said, you know, what Seeds has taught me is simply this. In order to make peace with your enemy, 
you have to go to war with yourself. Now, you think about what that means. The hardest thing in life, I think, is to separate yourself from the group, to examine honestly the conventions that you have been taught, to accept some and reject others, to make room for another narrative. When your tribe, your group, your religion, your family, basically has been conditioning you to mistrust, distrust, and sometimes hate the other. What goes on in Maine, if it's to last, needs to be followed up intensively. And we do all year round, year after year, tracking these 14, 15, and 16 year olds to their mid-20s. And it's very hard. Maine is tough, but Jerusalem Ramallah and Gaza and Cairo and Amman, it's much tougher. They go back, as I mentioned, from the future to the past. And there they are, they are exposed to the conventions and the pressures and the hostilities that perpetuate the conflict to begin with. And it's very hard for them. They're so enthusiastic and energized. The closest equivalent, uh, many of you may have had this experience, I have, the closest experience for an American to this is I remember, I remember when I came home from my freshman year at the University of Michigan, convinced my parents hadn't a clue what I had actually been through. And I saw it with my own kids, and I was much more sensitive to it. They're, they're transformed. They, they have this energy. They want to connect, and they don't know what to do. So we run all year programs for them, seminars, reunions, confidential lists serve called SeedsNet, in which hundreds can co-op, cooperate and communicate virtually. They publish a newspaper. Sesame Workshop, Sesame Street, is now training our Israeli and Palestinian graduates, 18, 19, and 20, to go into the kindergartens in the Jerusalem area to work with four to seven-year-olds using Sesame Street materials in Hebrew and in Arabic to emphasize the importance of diversity and, um, and tolerance. We're running another program called Beyond Borders, where we're taking Saudis, Iraqis, Egyptians, Jordanians, Yemenis, and putting them together with Americans from six U.S. cities, including a half dozen last summer in Maine from Los Angeles. Next week, we're taking the Americans and the Arabs and the educators that accompany the, these young people to Amman, Jordan, to give the Americans a regional experience. This is the way that you break down suspicion and mistrust. Our oldest kids are 25. They're a long way away from emerging into their respective political systems as leaders, but they will emerge over time, both in their communities as doctors, lawyers, educators, journalists, scientists, and maybe a few ultimately will accede to the corridors of power. One or two could change the, the essential contours, contours of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, sixth. Finally, I don't think, let me start this way. One of the saddest things that I've learned over the last two years in doing this job is that I'm not sure adults, and I, again, I'll put myself at the head of the list, really take young people seriously. I'm not sure that we do. I thought a lot about this. Now, I remember in July of 2000 when we were preparing to go to Camp David, I got a call from John Wallach, who founded this organization. He, that was the month John was diagnosed with cancer. And he said to me, you know, you're going to a summit with President Clinton and Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat. You've got to get these graduates up there. Not to tell the leaders how to negotiate, but to make the leaders aware of what the stakes are. The stakes are not Arafat's political future or Barak's electoral victory. The stakes are future generations in this region embodied by us. I listened very politely to what John had to say, and he tried hard to convince me. And I said, I, I'd, I'd see what I can do and hung up the phone. I knew I would never, ever, ever pass on his request to the Secretary of State so that she, at the time, could pass it on to the President. Why? Because I knew that I, would not be taken seriously if I, at a time when busy, important people, the 
President, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor were preparing for a very important summit, why would I pass on a request to have a bunch of kids there? Well, I'll never make that mistake again. And we need to really take a hard look at whether or not we are doing all we can to empower young people, provide, and provide them with the resources, particularly those who are involved in conflict, to give them what they need to travel down this very difficult road. Let me conclude with one final observation. I think the stakes here are very, very high. In the last century, there was a war in every single decade of the modern Arab-Israeli conflict, in 48, in 56, in 67, in 73, in 82. The 1990s was the only decade in the his modern history of the Arab-Israeli conflict when there was no major Arab-Israeli war. And there was a reason for that. This was the decade of Oslo, even though it failed. It was the decade of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. It was the decade of Israeli-Syrian negotiations. It was the decade of American diplomacy, both under Republican and Democratic administrations. My real fear and concern as we enter the 21st century, as we are into this first decade of the 21st century, is that the very principle that negotiating can resolve problems is now at serious risk. If that fails, if that dies, the notion that talking rather than shooting or killing is the way to get what you want, then I think we run the risk of surrendering the field to the forces of history. And if those forces of history could speak to you tonight, here in this place, here's what they'd say. They'd say, don't waste, don't waste your time on seeds of peace. Don't waste your time on the Arab-Israeli peace process. Don't waste your time on negotiation. Because we, the forces of history, know precisely how this conflict is going to end. There's going to be one winner, and there's going to be one loser. It is that illusion that the forces of history would have all of us believe. And no one, in my judgment, who cares about an American national interest, no one who cares about the well-being of the State of Israel, no one who cares about justice uh, for Palestinians and Arabs can afford to court that kind of outcome. I assure you that we at Seeds of Peace will not. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron has agreed to uh, take questions or respond to comments, but we'd like you to use these mics. Um, and I'd like to say that we're going to keep this to about 20 minutes. Is that all right? 20 minutes all right? Um, so who wants to start? You have to use one of these mics so that uh, the TV um, recording can pick it up. And I'm just going to stand over on the side. So who's going to start? You have to come to a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say I'm in very, very intrigued by what you told us tonight. My uh, eyes were glued to your lips. I wanted to remember every single word you said. But one thing I, I didn't really understood clearly. Uh, you talked about the young generations. I had the, the honor to meet uh, uh, Sharon and Arafat once in my life each and if you look at these guys One is dead now, but they will fight until I mean they cannot fight anymore But what about the young generation? Uh, you said that these uh, children young uh, persons with their green uh, shirts came to, to America and they, they transformed into a united uh, community, but let's assume for a moment that the young guys were in power, and the, the old guys left the stage. Do you think that uh, the young people in the two uh, communities would find the same experience that they got in America uh, and build up some kind of unified future? Uh, or do you think they will continue the same route uh, as was uh, scheduled by the two old uh, powerful men in that part of the world? Yes. I, I, I think that here is where the combination of what I call transactional diplomacy and transformational diplomacy becomes so important. If the current situation is allowed to continue and the behaviors adopted by Israelis and Palestinians continue, then the answer to that question is we'll have more of the same. And the young generation will inherit the bitterness and the hatred and the intolerance of their parents and their grandparents. 
It is the marriage of the transactional to create political agreements and end conflict with the transformational, the capacity to once political agreements are achieved and the situation on the ground changes, that you can begin to create there, not in Maine, the kinds of networks and lasting relationships that will in fact power these political agreements into something that you and I could remotely describe as real peace. But this is a generational proposition. The Arab-Israeli conflict evolved in phases over time. It is illogical to assume anything else than it will be resolved, if it's resolved at all, in phases over time. You know, Americans, and I, again, I have said this three times, and I'll say it again. I'll put myself at the head of the list. Americans think in terms of administrations. I measured my life in terms of administrations. In the region, time has a different concept. It's a different pace. They think in terms of generations, and why shouldn't they? It's a different conception of time, a different conception of progress. The stakes are much different. So time is the critical ingredient in most things. Time proves whether something is going to endure or whether it's going to fail. Whether it's a business or an invention or a marriage or an agreement. We're now, talk we're now seeing democratization in the Middle East. We're seeing the beginnings of a push for greater participatory governance. But just to give you an example, since 1950, only 22 countries in this world have maintained their democratic character and institutions without interruption. Only 22 in 55 years. And the ones who are now emerging democracies, well, We'll see. Time is critical, and time will be required to affect the kind of change and to determine the direction, whether it is going toward amelioration or toward protracted conflict. See if I'm, I'm on. Um, could I ask a question? I hardly, I never come down here and ask questions. I usually have to uh, sort of direct people. But I have a question that I think probably some of us share. And that is um, to ask your comment on the current phase that we seem to be going into, if only a current negotiation phase. I'd love to hear your comments on how that fits in, uh, I mean, knowing the, the full well. The situation between, um, between Sharon and uh, Abu Mazen, between Israelis and Palestinians? Correct, correct. I, I was in Jerusalem last week. I had long meetings with Israelis and Palestinians and an hour with President Abbas. And the, here's the good news. The good news is that the expectations gap between Israelis and Palestinians is narrower now than at any point since they began to negotiate with one another. They, each side really does believe right now that the other is only capable of limited steps. The last thing they need right now, and I made this point earlier tonight in another setting, is a negotiation that raises public expectations, that forces each side to posture publicly before their constituencies, or that expects some sort of dramatic results or development. What they're doing now, each in, its own, each in their own way, is taking small but important and significant steps unilaterally, which are coordinated quietly, to build a sense of trust and confidence. And the most important of all of those steps, one on each side, Palestinian commitment to deal with a cessation of violence and terror against the Israelis and a, and a reciprocal Israeli commitment, plus Prime Minister Sharon's decision, now backed by his government, to withdraw Israeli settlers and settlements from Gaza. This is the ultimate form of, of coordinated unilateralism. And it's hard to predict beyond July, which is when this disengagement withdrawal is, is, uh, is to take place, what, what will be. But for the first time in four years, there's a real chance to break through a very bitter and nasty stalemate. There is no chance, and I want to emphasize this point, there is zero chance of this year 
that Israelis and Palestinians will be any closer to resolving the core issues that divide them or the core issues that will be required to be addressed if there's going to be a permanent solution. And there are four of those issues, Jerusalem, borders, refugees, and security. All the other issues, water, settlements, all of that is, is derivative of one of those four issues. Um, and we, as mediators, have to, or would-be mediators, have to understand that. Try to find the right balance, how to ensure this process moves forward without breaking the bank by either ignoring it, doing too little, or alternatively doing too much. Yes. I have a question for you, but in the interest of having a peaceful drive home with my son, I do want to say, make one comment on what you just said, which is, although there are all kinds of equivalencies, and the essence of what you're talking about with Seeds for Peace has to do with recognizing the fundamental equivalency of human beings that transcends the conflict, there isn't an equivalency between the cessation of terror on the part of the terrorists within the Palestinian side and the violence that the Israelis have been responsible for. One is, with, with rare exception, not about terror, not about inflicting terror on civilian populations deliberately, and the other is. And it, it violates some, some sense of, of truth to me to, it was, it was a very brief comment you made, but it, it violates some sense of truth to make that equivalency. The question I have for you is, concerning the role of America in that you, you identified as, as being able to play a very important role. And the Bush administration came up with a very nifty phrase, roadmap to peace. And it's not clear what they did in the first term beyond that to realize that road to peace. From your perspective, as a, a quasi-insider, long-term insider, in fact, what do you see as the administration's temperament and, and will in terms of the role it may play in the next, the next chapter. Yeah, at first, in, in, with regard to your first comment, if you look at the language that emerged from the Sharm el Sheikh summit, um, there's great equivalence in the cessation of, of military activities. The Israelis don't use the word terror, obviously, um, against both sides. And I don't, I'm, I'm not interested in trying to, you know, equate uh, and try to de try to determine. Um, because, in, in, in effect, if the Israelis and the Palestinians sat around trying to figure out whether one act, set of actions was a response to the other, even though that's what their political constituencies do, um, we wouldn't have a Sharm el Sheikh agreement and we wouldn't have what appears to be, last Friday, Friday night's attack notwithstanding, a mutual cessation of attacks by both sides against the other. Um, as far as the Bush administration is concerned, uh, the roadmap is a very fine document. I, I helped to draft it when I was uh, still at State Department. But it, it was not implemented, and it's never going to be implemented. Not unless, um, well, it won't be implemented because the parties don't own it. Now, they say they accept it, but I don't, I don't buy that. They didn't write it, they didn't create it, and they're not going to invest in it. Larry Summers, who's a friend of mine, has been in the news lately. He's made some very controversial statements. I saw him at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we talked about it for a while. But I'm, about, I'm reminded about one of, the, one of the other statements that he made, which is very appropriate here. He said, in the history of the world, no one has ever washed a rental car. <laughs> and La Larry's, Larry's point is right, because you, own, you don't take care of what you don't own which you don't invest in. So the roadmap is a fine document. The parties don't own it. They didn't draft it. They didn't negotiate it. And frankly, the Bush administration, through its first four years, and I have a lot of respect for both the President and Powell, and it's not a matter of Democratic or Republican politics, um, they didn't do much about it either. The core, core challenge for the Bush administration is to make one basic judgment. Do they believe that the pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace is a priority for the United States or not? If they reach the, the judgment that it, that it is a priority, good things will happen. If they don't, then the Israelis and the Palestinians are on their own. And while they can achieve many things on their own, ultimately, they'll never secure anything lasting without our help. 
which is my view. And I don't think the Bush administration, second Bush administration, has reached a decision on that matter. Administrations engage in this issue for many reasons. Some believe it is strategic interest to the United States. Some believe it's a moral interest. Some believe they want to create a legacy. They, they think they, they can succeed. In this current environment, in the wake of 9-11, in my view, this issue is critically important, not just to the political interests of the United States, but to the security interests of the United States. Because this issue is used by a disturbingly, a disturbingly large minority, and, I'll, I, and I will pick my word, choose my words very carefully here, a disturbingly large minority of Arabs and Muslims in South Asia and the Middle East to hammer the United States, to incite against us, and to rile people up uh, to commit violence. And we could diffuse not all, we could diffuse a large part of that if we chose to engage in a sensible and effective way on the one issue that resonates from even India and Pakistan to North Africa. You know, I'm a baseball fan, and the, um, I, I now have a baseball team in my town. I mean, I didn't until I had to go to drive to Baltimore, and I'll still drive to Baltimore to watch the Orioles, but I now have a, the Washington Nationals. Now a bit, you know, now a Washington baseball team. But I, I bring this up only because I'm reminded of the words of the, uh, the, the great venerable Casey Stengel, who said that the key to good management was keeping the nine guys who hate your guts, I mentioned this to you earlier, away from the nine guys who haven't made up their minds. And the key to affecting people's attitudes in this part of the world, the vast majority have not yet made up their minds about the United States. This issue would help immensely. So I hope the Bush administration will become more active, but, I, but I'm by no means certain of it. Yes? What are the criteria in choosing these uh, 14, 15, and 16-year-olds? English is the sine qua non. I mean, you know, you hear many different languages at SEEDS. You hear, you hear Hindi, you, you hear Urdu, you hear, we have Afghan kids, you hear, you hear Pushtun. Hebrew, Arabic, but English is critical. It's a camp based on communication and dialogue among people who don't speak the same language, and English is the world's preferred second language. Um, motivation to leadership, but not political correctness. In other words, I don't want, and this is the thing people misunderstand, I don't want a bunch of peaceniks. That doesn't do me any good, and it won't do the future any good, because in the end, Peace will be made not by the left and not by the right. It will be made and conditioned and supported by the center. I want authentic and genuine Israelis and Palestinians who understand that they don't like each other for legitimate reasons, but who are prepared to reach out and understand the needs of the other side. It's that genuineness, genuineness and that authenticity that I, that I think we need. And we get kids from refugee camps. We get kids from settlements. We don't get the, the ultras don't come to Seeds of Peace. I, I don't get kids of Hamas leaders, and I don't get kids of ultra-Orthodox Jewish militants in remote settlements in the West Bank. I, I don't get, I mean, but that's self-evident. But I do get young Israelis who come pushing transfer, the solution to the Palestinian problem is just to get rid of all Palestinians, move them out. I get Palestinians who deny the Holocaust, who deny that it ever took place. Forget quibbling over how many Jews were killed. Who deny it ever took place, and who deny the existence of the State of Israel, even within, even within 1948 borders. It's rough. And that's good, because you don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with your enemies. And that's the way it should be. Yes? 
I just wanted to say um, thank you for coming to speak here. I'm a senior here and I'm majoring in law and society, so I've been to tons of conferences on Arab and Israeli peacemaking and usually I feel as if they're, you know, biased and they always do point fingers, you know, saying it is a good versus a bad and I'm always wondering how, you know, if, if, the, if the problem seems so simple and it's just a um, group of people that are lacking rights, how come we can't solve it? And I think how you mentioned your first point it is very complex and it dates back. So I just think it's important for people to to hear that side of the story. So thank you. Thank you. If you're interested in becoming, if you, you want an experience that'll change your life, apply to be a counselor for three for three weeks. It's really quite remarkable. It's a remarkable experience. You're all too old to become participants at 14, 15, or 16. But it's also a great way to get into a prestigious US, uh, US university. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Aaron David Miller for this extraordinary presentation.